Good morning. It's wonderful to see you all here in God's house for worship this morning as we continue this long service theme of followership. Uh, a few Sundays ago, you mentioned, you heard me bring up the game Follow the Leader. We love that game when we're the leader, right? Because if you hop on one foot, everyone else has to hop on one foot. If you skip, everybody else has to skip. Everyone has to follow what you do. And in this world, it's interesting, we, we like being the leader, right? We like it when other people agree with us. We like it when it's our way, that's the best way. We want to be the center of our world and everyone else is, is wrapped around us. What's interesting is in these readings this morning, Christ tells us as we follow him, as we discuss followership, it's not about pride, it's not about being first or number one. Actually, in this world, you and I should strive to be the very last of all people, serving all people and serving all things. And you'll see that humility in our first reading. You'll see it talked about the danger of pride from James in our second reading. And in our gospel this morning, where the sermon is based out of, Jesus illustrates and talks about that lastness that we strive for in serving others to give glory to our God. We'll begin our service this morning with hymn eight, uh, 582, as printed for us in page 2 of our bulletin. Spirit. If we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, God is faithful and just, and will forgive us our sins, and purify us from all unrighteousness. Let us confess our sins to 
to the Lord. Holy God, gracious Father, I am sinful by nature and have sinned against you in my thoughts, words, and actions. I have not loved you with my whole heart. I have not loved others as I should. I deserve your punishment both now and forever. But trust Jesus, my Savior, paid for my sins with his innocent suffering and death. Trusting in him, I pray, God have mercy on me, a sinner. Our gracious Father in heaven has been merciful to us. He sent his only son, Jesus Christ, who gave his life as the atoning sacrifice for the sins of the whole world. Therefore, as a called servant of Christ and by his authority, I forgive you all your sins. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. In peace, let us pray to the Lord. peace from above and for our salvation let us pray to the Lord for the peace of the whole world for the well-being of the church of God and for the unity of all let us pray to the Lord for this holy house and for all who offer here their worship and praise let us pray to the Lord Comfort and defend us, gracious Lord. Moses because of his Cushite wife, for he had married a Cushite. 
Has the Lord spoken only through Moses, they asked? Hasn't he also spoken through us? And the Lord heard this. Now Moses was a very humble man, more <laughs> humble than anyone else on the face of the earth. At once the Lord said to Moses, Aaron, and Miriam, Come out of the tent of meeting, all three of you. So the three of them went out. Then the Lord came down in a pillar of cloud. He stood at the entrance to the tent and summoned Aaron and Miriam. Then the two of them stepped forward. He said, Listen to my words. When there is a prophet among you, I, the Lord, reveal myself to them in visions. I speak to them in dreams. But this is not true of my servant Moses. He is faithful in all my house. With him I speak face to face, clearly and not in riddles. He sees the form of the Lord. Why then were you not afraid to speak against my servant Moses? The anger of the Lord burned against them and he left them. When the cloud lifted from above the tent, Miriam's skin was leprous. It became white as snow. Aaron turned toward her and saw that she had a defiling skin disease. And he said to Moses, Please, my Lord, I ask you not to hold against us the sin we have so foolishly committed. Do not let her be like a stillborn infant coming from its mother's womb with its flesh half eaten away. So Moses cried out to the Lord, Please, God, heal her. The Lord replied to Moses, If her, spot, if her father had spit in her face, would she not have been in disgrace for seven days? Confine her outside the camp for seven days. After that, she can be brought back. So Miriam was confined outside the camp for seven days, and the people did not move on till she was brought back. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Our second reading is from James chapter 3. Who is wise and understanding among you? Let them show it by their good life, by deeds done in the humility that comes from wisdom. But if you harbor bitter envy and selfish ambition in your hearts, do not boast about it or deny the truth. Such wisdom does not come down from heaven, but is earthly, unspiritual, demonic. For where you have envy and selfish ambition, there you find disorder in every evil practice. But the wisdom that comes from heaven is first of all pure, then peace-loving, considerate, submissive, full of mercy and good fruit, impartial and sincere. Peacemakers who sow in peace reap a harvest of righteousness. The word of the Lord. Please stand to acclaim the gospel. Anyone who wants to be first must be the very last. The Gospel according to Mark chapter 9. They left that place and passed through Galilee. Jesus did not anyone to know, did not want anyone to know where they were, because he was teaching his disciples. He said to them, the Son of Man is going to be delivered into the hands of men. They will kill him, and after three days he will rise. But they did not understand what he meant, and were afraid to ask him about it. They came to Capernaum. When he was in the house, he asked them, What were you arguing about on the road? But they kept quiet, because on the way they had argued about who was the greatest. Sitting down, Jesus called the twelve and said, Anyone who wants to be first must be the very last and the servant of all. He took a little child whom he placed among them. Taking the child in his arms, he said to them, Whoever welcomes one of these little children in my name welcomes me. And whoever welcomes me does not welcome me, but the one who sent me. The Gospel of our Lord. Praise be to you, Christ. Congregation may be seated as we join in singing our hymn of the day, hymn 767.
So every once in a while, on a harvest moon or a blue moon, parents, this weird thing happens to our kids, our little angels that we love and adore and throw affection at. Uh, they kind of turn into the Hulk. You know what I mean? It's just that fit of rage where maybe they get overtired or maybe they, they want to get spoiled a little more and you say something like, hey, it's time to get to bed and oh no, here we go. We've committed the cardinal sin. Bedtime? No way. So they run around stamping their feet and they, they say, you can't, you're not the boss of me. You, you can't tell me what to do. You know, or we're in the grocery store in the checkout line and there's that M&M's tube. Can't stand those things. They put them right at kid level. Right? And the girls see that and they go, Dad? And of course, I'm a weak father. So I usually get them the candy, but the few times they say, no, it's going to spoil our dinner. Or, no, we've had enough candy today. Oh, no! Now you've done it. We're going to kick, scream, and fight till the whole store, the store next to the store, and the people in the parking lot know what you have done. You know what's interesting? Pretty much the moment our kids can talk, they have that me first attitude built in them, right? The world revolves around them. Mom and dad, you're wrapped around their little finger. Everything they want, everything they think is right, well, that's the way it has to be. Me first, me first, me first. And what's interesting is as we get older, that me first attitude, it grows up with us. You know, here are the disciples. As Mark records it, Peter, James, and John just come down the mountain after they say they see Jesus' transfiguration. Right? His glory shows for that brief moment. It's heaven on earth on the top of this mountain. And they come down from that, and they come to this scene where the other disciples are bickering with the teachers of the law, the Pharisees and the religious rulers, because this man brought a boy who was possessed. And so the disciples tried to cast out this demon, and they couldn't do it. And so you can only imagine the Pharisees licking their lips on that one. And so this fight ensues, and Jesus comes down, and, and as this fight's going on and crowds are gathering, he tells that demon to, to take a hike. And with nothing more and nothing less, that demon goes. And now they're, they're walking on the road through Galilee, coming to Capernaum. And when they're in this house... Jesus identifies the conversation on their trip. He, he says to them, what were you arguing about on the road? And the disciples, probably for good reason, were quiet because they knew this conversation was not one that Jesus would have been particularly fond of. We're told that they were arguing about who was the greatest among them. What did this argument look like? Was it a childish argument where two siblings have with each other? Peter, James, and John come down the mountain and the other disciples say, hey, what were you doing? And like little kids, they say, Jesus said, we can't tell you. Whoa. Now you have the disciples in a fit of rage. Who are you? To not be able to tell us. You think you're better than me, Peter? Ah, uh, Mr. Get Behind Me, Satan? Right, or was this argument more of a sophisticated argument? <clears throat> These disciples just saw this demon that could not be cast out by them. Jesus just came down and showed them who's boss. Get out. And maybe the disciples were busy having delusional daydreams about Christ bringing this kingdom here into our world and oh, the special positions they're going to have as the, as the 12 disciples and maybe they're divvying up the land in a sense for this kingdom. And, and of course the question comes, well, who's going to be the right-hand guy of Christ, right? <laughs> Was it more of an argument like that? Whether it was a childish one, whether well, it was delusional jay daydreams and sophisticated arguments and complaints, there's that attitude. Me first. And our children and the disciples said, well, they're not alone. We saw that in our Old Testament reading, too, as this family drama plays out. Here's, here's Moses 
Miriam and, and Aaron and Aaron and Miriam, they, they've had enough. They've had enough of Moses being the guy. So, so they began to speak against Moses because of his wife. And, and they say, has the Lord spoken? Has the Lord only spoken through Moses? Hasn't he spoken through us also? And you can just sense that jealousy, that rub. We're important too. There it is. That me first attitude. And well, then there's you and me, right? The grown-up kids. You know, it's interesting. Luther had this, this unique quote, or he made this comment at one point. I'm not sure when in his ministry or life, but apparently he said, everybody wants to be Pope, to get his own way, at the expense of any and all who get in the way. As a pastor, I like that thought. Complete and total control over everything. No deliberating about hymns. No question about what I'm doing in the front of church throughout services. I'm first. I'm number one. Yikes. And as people, we like that thought too. Us being number one. And it shows itself sometimes, doesn't it? Maybe there have been the fights. Well, I'm on the council and you're not on the council. Well, I'm on the worship committee and you're not. Well, I'm a part of Ladies Aid and you're not. And that bickering grows. We all have different perspectives. We all have different ideas. But we all have in common that idea and desire to be first. And so we turn into a larger version of the 12 disciples as the devil leads our sinful natures to rub and fight with each other, whether it's about the way we worship or who's pastor's favorite, which, by the way, I will not tell you who my favorite is. I don't have any. And the scary thing about this, too, is as we fight and argue with each other, as we feel that our opinion is always the best and everyone else should just listen to us, you're only a hop, skip, and a breath away from doing the same thing to God. God in his word says, live to give me glory. And as adults, we mouth off to God. I want to live to give me glory. God in his word says, no, do not live in this sinner. No, do not act and talk this way. No, we want to do these things because ultimately, I'm number one, God. You come second. And boy, to be completely and blunt and honest with you, you know, while it may be nice in this world to put ourselves first, to treat everybody else like they're background characters, like our opinions are always the best, like they don't matter and everyone is here to serve us, the spiritual damage we cause to ourselves is insane. That's what James mentions. He says, but if you harbor bitter envy and selfish ambition in your hearts, do not boast about it or deny the truth. Such wisdom does not come down from heaven. It was earthly, unspiritual. Here's an interesting description, demonic. For where you have envy and selfish ambition, there you find disorder in every evil practice. What a sad thing it is when the people of God argue with each other about who's the best. And so what does our, our Savior do to these arguing disciples? What, what does he, he, he do for us? He, he has a Garden of Eden moment. You know, parents, when your kids are fighting and someone breaks something, you know who broke it. But you come to them and you say, hey, tell me what happened. What are you doing? You're giving your child a chance to confess what happened. God did the same thing in the Garden of Eden. Christ does the same thing here. He knows exactly what they're talking about. There's no such thing as whispering so God's ears don't hear it. But he gives them a chance to confess. To confess the fact the conversation was simple. To confess the fact that there is no such thing as being first in the kingdom of God and first in this world. And as he does so, he very lovingly lays out the truth. He, he doesn't treat them poorly. He doesn't be, he's not sarcastic with them. He's not mean to them. He doesn't treat them uh, like they deserve as bickering children over who's the best. He simply comes to them and shares the wonderful truth. He says, look, if you want to be first in the kingdom of God, 
You must be last. As a matter of fact, you must be the very last. And a servant of not just a few, not just your favorites, but of all. And as Christ says these words, he's doing just that. You know what's interesting? As these disciples are potentially mentally bickering, they're putting their arguments together about who's the best and who should come first, Jesus just drops this gospel gem, what seems like out of the air on them. As he says, the Son of Man is going to be betrayed into the hands of men. They will kill him, and after three days, he will rise. Christ right there redirects them. Let's talk about how Christ has served all and how Christ has served you and me. Let's start with the basics. Let's go to Christmas. The Word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. It's not that becoming flesh would benefit God in any way. But he puts himself behind us to serve us, to be our perfect substitute. The Son of Man would lay aside his divine power and glory for a time and instead get hungry, get sore feet, feel tired, grow sleepy, deal with temptation, deal with rebellion, feel the sting of death that you and I are all too familiar with in our lives as he weeps outside the tomb of his friend and deals with the rejection of people. Jesus doesn't do that because it benefits him in any way. He does it, he does it because of his service to you. Still, we have the ultimate example of him serving us all. As the Son of Man, untouchable in the heavens, surrounded by his angels and the choirs of saints that praise him and all the world that is astounded by his name, allows the physical hands of wicked men to grab him, to beat him, their tongues to mock him, their words to verbally assault him, to nail him to a cross, and for him to close his eyes in death. Also that our sins would be paid for. Our debt would be paid in full. And that by him taking his life back up again, you and I would, would do the thing that we could not do on our own. We would have the hope of eternal life in heaven. Jesus goes to the absolute extreme of serving you and me. An unconditional, amazing, an astonishing love with his perfect life, his suffering on the cross, and his resurrection from the dead, so that you and I would have victory. That is serving all. So Jesus says those words. If anyone wants to be first, he must be the very last and the servant of all. Jesus is the perfect fulfillment of those words. Jesus is the perfect example of those words. But he's more than just a fulfillment. He's more than just an example. Jesus is the motivation, the reason that we go from those screaming kids that say me first in everything to children of God that say me last. Enjoy. Because it's his unconditional love that motivates us to do the same. It's his serving all that motivates us to want to get up in the morning, eager to serve all, eager to do all things that we can, eager to share the love of Christ with others, eager, eager, eager to be that unconditional love to someone else that Christ has and is being to you and to me. It's interesting, as the disciples are bickering about who's the greatest, First of all, Jesus just drops the mic in a sense, that gospel gem, to show how he is serving them unconditionally in love as a servant of all. Jesus then later talks about it as he explains that if you want to be great in the kingdom of God, you must be the last and a servant of all. And still, Jesus is not done teaching with a wonderful illustration. He brings home who we get to serve as children of God, eager to share that unconditional love that Christ has so greatly lavished on you and me. We're told that he takes this child, he brings this child into his arms, and, 
And he says to his disciples, whoever welcomes one of these little children in my name welcomes me. And whoever welcomes me does not welcome me, but the one who sent me. All right, kids, here we go. According to a poll in 2003, do you know how much it costs to raise you from the age of zero to 18? $331,000 and 900, oh wait, no, $331,993. That's it. That's a weird number to pull. I would estimate it to be about $400,000. I gotta ask you something. So, so if your parents spend about four hundred thousand dollars to raise you, are, are you planning on paying them back? Anyone? Yes, no's. I see a few no's. You are wise financial planners. Pretty sure we don't see that kind of money in our lifetimes, right? Four hundred thousand dollars to raise you. Okay, so let's do something else. Let's do something else. So, so you know how much time it takes to raise you? There's no statistic on this. I'm just going to make an educated guess. Let's just say it takes a million hours, parents. A million hours in between grocery shopping, changing diapers, getting them to school, becoming their personal chauffeur to all the different events <laughs> as they just get busier and busier. Let's just say it takes a million hours. So, so little ones, are you planning on doing a million hours worth of nice things to your parents? I see, I see conflict over here. Yeah. <laughs> Probably not, right? That's exactly Jesus' point. He takes a child, one of the most dependent and helpless things in this world, and he says, serve them. Serve people that cannot pay you back. Serve people that have no, no hope of giving you back the time that you spent, that have no chance of financially reimbursing you for what you've done. Serve them. And there are so many people in this world that could use that, couldn't they? Not just the children, but the, but the mentally disabled, the physically disabled, the neighbor that needs help down the road getting the groceries or getting the mail, the, the mother and father that lives in our house that can't live on their own. There are so many people that we can serve in that situation. And on top of that, as Jesus gives this this suggestion of serving those who cannot repay us back. A little later, he goes on to say this wonderful little truth. If anyone gives you a cup of cold water in my name, the reward will be great. So you don't need to do big, big acts of service. Those are nice, and thank God for those who do do them. But even the small ones. Parents, as you change diapers, you're serving your Lord. You're showing that unconditional love. As you pray with your kid at night, or as you teach them that hymn for Mission Fest for our pre-K kids, you're serving your Lord. And he sees that. As you become the ear in your family to, to listen to someone who needs to vent or has to complain or has had a long week, there you are silently but wonderfully serving your Lord. As you sit next to somebody in the coffee shop or a quick trip and you bring up, you know, church, or hey, why don't you come with me and see, see what you think? There you're serving your Lord in that little conversation. Those small acts of service do not get flown over God's head. Or ignored by him. He delights in them. He rejoices in them. And in those moments, there the Holy Spirit does this wonderful thing as he takes this heart that says, Me first, captivates it, and now makes this heart says, Me last, in joy and eagerness, so that others can come to hear that they have a Savior who served them in all things and still does as well. So that you yourself can grow in faith and continue that service again and again till that wonderful day comes when you will see your Lord and He will say, Well done, good and faithful servant. What unconditional love that Christ has shown us, and what a privilege it is that we get to share that unconditional love, even in small ways, to each other, to our family members, our friends, and to our neighbors, or the people we just rub shoulders with at work. This is being last in all things. This is serving Christ. You know, uh, it's kind of interesting, it was just a few days ago, Every once in a while, I'll, I'll tease my wife. She'll say, hey, can you do something? I'll say, you're not the boss of me. 
Well, I ate my words because my daughter said the same thing to me. <laughs> From little on, we, we have this idea of me first. Me first. And as we get older, that sinful nature continues to keep us in common with Miriam, Aaron, the disciples in the world, arguing with each other. Who is the greatest in God's kingdom? Who comes first? Who's the pastor's favorite? Who's the one that's in charge of everything? Whatever it may be, me first. Yet, we look at God's word and we see how Jesus has placed our physical and spiritual needs above his very own. How God himself has placed your life above the life of his one and only son. It's that unconditional love that motivates us. It's that unconditional love that as children of God, we, we strive to go from being first to becoming last. It's that unconditional love we, we delight in showing to others all an act of God's grace. Therefore, we put everyone's needs before our own, serving all so that they too one day can serve their Lord. Amen. Please stand. And the peace of God which transcends all understanding will guard your hearts and minds through faith in Christ Jesus. Amen. We join together confessing our faith using the words of the Apostles' Creed found on page 9 in your bulletins or as it appears before you on the screen. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. The congregation may be seated for the offering. Till in her. 
Please stand for prayer. In our prayers this morning, we, we pray for two of our sisters in Christ. The first is uh, Wanda Pruka, who was called home to her heavenly home this past week. And we thank God for that, that he's taken her from this veil of tears and brought her where now she sees her Savior face to face in those wonderful glories he won for her. We also pray for, for Jim and Cheryl Veglon. Uh, late in the week, uh, Mrs. Veglon was sent to the hospital with pneumonia. She came back home, went to the hospital again, came back home again, and now she's doing much better at home, and she's able to recover there, and she's with her husband, Jim. So we thank God for that, that he delivered them through that as well. Heavenly Father, you have taken us from all nations and united us in the body of your Son. Send your Holy Spirit to rid your children of all bitter jealousy, boasting, and selfish ambition. Fill the baptized with your wisdom, that we may lead peaceable lives with sincerity and love. Uphold this world in your order. Preserve the church in the preaching of your word against all enemies. Bless our homes, that parents and children may serve one another faithfully and grow in the instruction and faith until life's end. Give health and wisdom to all who serve in public office, that their authority may be exercised for the benefit of our people. You do not abandon your children to suffer alone, but promise to care for all who call upon your name. Bless the homebound, the lonely, the depressed and anxious, those preparing for surgery, the ill and the dying. We thank you, Lord, for delivering Wanda from this world broken in sin to the eternal home Jesus has won for her with his life, death, and resurrection. Comfort the grieving. Bring peace into Wanda's family that the world cannot give by sending your word to them. Remind them, Lord, that you are the good shepherd who will guide and keep them in the days of sorrow and struggle to come. And you are the good shepherd who has won forgiveness and eternal life for them as well. We thank you for being with your little lamb, Cheryl, by delivering her safely home from the hospital to be with her husband. We ask that you would bless her body as she recovers. Guide the minds and the hands of the doctors that work with her and keep her safe in your care. Into your hands we commend all for whom we pray, trusting in your mercy through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. And Lord, we ask that you would hear us as we join in the prayer our Savior has taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. The congregation may be seated as we join in singing hymn 709, as directed in our bulletins on page 10.
Gracious God, you nourish my faith with the good news that you have forgiven my sins in Christ. Let the gospel be proclaimed by all who come to worship today, by ministers called to preach the gospel, by musicians who adorn the gospel with beauty, and by all who proclaim the gospel in song and prayer. Let the miracle of your forgiving love touch my heart and the hearts of all. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look on you with favor and give you peace. Amen. The congregation may be seated as we join in singing our closing hymn, hymn 842. sermon so you get a mini 30 second one too now after the service but also notice the love of God as he tells us this it's not the easiest topic to talk about but he cares so much they make sure that you and I know uh, what we should strive to be in others and replicating his love for us and we thank God for that uh, the announcements are before you in the bulletins this morning just maybe two to highlight the first would be as you heard Mrs. Pruka was called home to heaven here this week the funeral uh, information's on the back there but as of right now, the funeral is scheduled to be next, this coming Friday at 1.30 at, at Hyler Cemetery. Pastor and Mother and myself will be the, there to, to lead a, a graveside service. And to my understanding, it is open for everyone to attend. So you're welcome to attend uh, to show support to the family. Give thanks to God for taking her home and freeing her from this world of, of suffering and pain. Uh, the other thing, too, is so there is the Applefest Parade today coming up pretty fast here at, at 1 o'clock. Uh, Feel free to come and show your support to the school and also to the church. And, you know, parades are awesome. It's great evangelism opportunities because as the float goes by, just nudge the person and say, hey, that's a great church. Right? And the conversation started. There, I'll be just wave at me and I'll come over immediately and harass them to come. So I'm working with you there, too. So love to see you all there and cheer for the kiddos and things like that as well. Uh, that's all the announcements. Oh, thank you, Mrs. Huff. And uh, Miss Pratt.
Pyatt. It's going to take a while. Miss Pyatt for leading us in worship this morning. It was wonderful that they have you sing and play for us too as well. That's all the announcements I have for you this morning. So until we come to the Lord's house again, may he send his angels to watch over you and your families. Have a blessed week in the Lord.